Welcome back to Rosa Luxemburg at 150, revisiting her radical life and legacy, a online symposium hosted by the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung and the International Rosa Luxemburg Society. My name is Lauren. Uh, I'm an editor at the Stiftung. And this next panel will be on the question uh, or on Rosa Luxemburg today. Uh, the accumulation of capital and the mass strike in the crisis of neoliberal capitalism. And with that, I will hand it over to our chair, Ingo Schmidt. Um, thanks very much, Lauren. Uh, welcome everybody out there in the virtual world. I can, uh, I hope that you all can see and hear us now. Um, as Lauren said, my name is Ingo Schmidt. I'm host of this session, which uh, means I do not have uh, much to do other than uh, introducing um, uh, our fabulous uh, speakers, and uh, we have four of them. Um, we will start with Ricardo Bellafiore, who will speak about uh, Marxism after Luxembourg. Then we have Radhika Desai, uh, who will talk about uh, capitalism in, and imperialism through the lenses of Rosa Luxemburg and what that means today. And from those more theoretical uh, and uh, economic uh, perspectives, we are moving on to considerations around the mass strike. And on that one, we have uh, also two speakers. We have Rida Vakas, uh, who will talk about the mass strike and international labor. And we have Robert Ovitz, uh, who will talk about the mass strike and strategy. And naturally, I apologize for butchering people's names. Uh, it's just a sign of my own ignorance, uh, but you can retaliate uh, any time. And uh, with that, uh, I'll give the floor to the speakers. The rules of order are simple. Um, everyone will present for about 15 minutes. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> that will give us uh, a lot of time for Q&A um, after the four presentations uh, are done. And uh, I will be back uh, moderating those. And with that, uh, please uh, join me welcoming Ricardo Bellofiore for the first presentation in this uh, session. Ricardo, floor is all yours. Uh, thank you, Ingo, and thank you to the organizers. I am particularly honored to speak uh, the, the, the day of the birthday uh, of Rosa Luxemburg, or Ruja Luxemburg, how she's probably pronounced in Polish. Let me begin with a, a short personal uh, note. Uh, I made my dissertation uh, in curing with Claudio Napoleoni on Ruja Luxemburg uh, in 75, 76, so a long time ago. Why on, on her? Uh, I didn't have a topic. He asked me on what I wanted to do the dissertation. I was just reading uh, Paul Froelich's, uh, Paul Froelich's biography, and there was exactly at the chapter a candle burning from both uh, sides. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, she thought of herself, and she was, and not only because of her degree, first and foremost as a political was a, a political economist. Of course, in her own way, critical and revolutionary. Uh, since uh, I, I told you when I, I made the dissertation, you may imagine that uh, I was there in the late 60s and early 70s, and then Rosa Luxemburg was entrapped uh, in the discussion as a spontaneous and a collapsist uh, theorist. In the 80s and 90s, unfortunately, uh, especially in Italy, but I fear also elsewhere, she became a kind of romantic icon. Uh, in fact, not only my dissertation, but most of my writings uh, in political economy have been constantly inspired and in dialogue with her, uh, even though probably I, I recognize this more than, than others. And I was, I was also fighting these reductionist views of her as a spontaneous or as a collapse, just a collapse uh, theorist. Rosa Luxemburg is too often assessed in this jointed way. Uh, those who look at the political writings, those who look at the economic contributions, those who look at her as a person and so on. I think there is uh, the need of a unitary perspective, connecting all these aspects. 
in my very short speech here, I will go on with a, an implicit tentative distinction between Rosa Luxemburg as the Marxist and Rosa Luxemburg and the Marxian. The speech is so short that actually I don't think I, I, I have the time to explain the distinction that I hope will be evident at the end. But uh, in any case, uh, uh, we may discuss that in, in the debate area. Let me start with Rosa Luxemburg, the Marxist. Uh, uh, there is an article in 1903 uh, by Rosa Luxemburg, Stagnation and Progress of Marxism. It is exemplary of a Marxist attitude. She says that Marx in his scientific writings outstripped, outstripped us as a party of practical fighters. It is not true that Marx no longer suffices for our needs, on the contrary, our needs are not yet adequate for the utilization of Marx's ideas. In uh, some writings uh, on political economy, in 1900, Zuruk of Adam Smith, it was a review article uh, for uh, a, a, a German book. And in 1905, the review of Kowski's uh, edition of volume one of the theories of surplus value, she adheres to the uh, thesis that political economy is exhausted uh, after Ricardo and there are no more scientific developments in bourgeois theory since, uh, since then. So uh, only Marxism. Uh, the, the best example in all senses of Rosa Luxemburg, the Marxist, is her pamphlet in 1899, Social Reform or Revolution. There, uh, she defend the orthodoxy against revisionism, and rightly so on many grounds. Uh, uh, she goes against the uh, idea of Berset that trustified capitalism is witnessing less severe contradictions. Rather, she says there are more severe contradictions. Socialism is not an ethical neo-Kantian choice, but uh, unfortunately, she identified revolutionary Marxism with collapse theory and uh, uh, tendencies to stagnation. But it is also a masterpiece. I can't go into the detail uh, here, but she is very brilliant in uh, inserting a dialectical dynamics uh, on the side of capital and on the side of uh, the working class between uh, a tendency and a counter tendency, the tendency to the concentration of capital and the counter tendency to the resurgency of small and medium firms. Uh, the tendency to the unification of the working class and uh, today the and and the counter tendency of the deconstruction of the working class uh, these are pages which could be useful reread and discussed today in an, with, with, with open mind let me go to rosa luxemburg the marxian here the point is simply based on the motto that marx preferred doubt everything Doubt everything means also doubting Marx himself, being uh, willing to go beyond Marx, with Marx, but also against Marx. Of course, here one thinks of her lectures on Marx at the party school, where she started questioning the schemes of reproduction. Here, since the speech is very, is very short, I uh, will look uh, uh, from after, from today at, at their writings. and start with the consideration that I think Rosa Luxemburg as a critical political economist cannot be understood if we don't read together the introduction to political economy, the accumulation of capital and the anti-critique. So let me say, start with the introduction to political economy. Uh, there, the idea be, is uh, at the beginning the same as, as in social reform or revolution. The abstraction of labor is real. Money is a component of value uh, in a money as a commodity system. This materialization of uh, abstract labor in value happens at the crossroads between production and circulation. This uh, is a movement 
uh, from production to circulation, but at the same time, in the introduction to political economy, she clarifies that it is a movement uh, also in which demand drives production. Uh, differently than in feudalism, uh, the income of the direct producers here, the real wage of the working class is known ex ante, but the surplus is yet to be determined within the hidden abode uh, of production. So there is a stress, at least implicitly, in, on the determination of value and surplus value in the conflict in the labor process. And there is also a stress in a dynamic competition uh, which determines the relative surplus value, but determining the relative surplus value determines also a tendential fall of the relative wage. If there is this tendential fall of the relative wage, she argues, there is a wage share falls, but then there is the need of an higher demand gap to be filled and uh, capitalist demand needs to fill uh, the demand which is lacking for having a full realization of the product. Mm -hmm. This is of course from where uh, her, her book of the 1913 starts. But let me, before going to the accumulation of capital, say something of her reply to her critics. Because her reply to her critics is maybe more brilliant than the book itself, because it clarifies that it is very explicit that it is set in a macro monetary interpretation of the schemes of reproduction. There is the centrality of the issue of finance, the monetary financing of demand at the end of the circuit and the monetary financing of production at the start of the circuit. In more or less uh, implicitly, she was in dialogue with a crucial team uh, in the monetary heterodox from Vixel uh, to Robertson to Schumpeter to Keynes treatise on money. And you understand from there, uh, from where Kaleski, uh, Kaleski comes. Uh, the, the point to be understood, however, is that for her, the question which she, uh, which, with which she deals in the accumulation of capital is very clearly the following one. From where does it come the monetary, capitalistically productive demand? Capitalistically productive demand means investment means capitalist investment. She is not an underconsumptionist. For her, the issue is in modern terminology, underinvestment. And the best uh, understanding, though not completely, of course, of her is in John Robinson introduction to the accumulation of capital, where the problem uh, of demand is the problem of accumulation of capital in a dynamical setting in new rounds, what is the motive uh, uh, to show that there is an, un, an, an investment which ex post always realized surplus value. Uh, it is clear why militarism is an answer to a problem because uh, the activities producing militarism are productive of surplus value, but are not reproductive. So they are capitalist investment, but they are not just an adding of generic demand. So in a sense, she anticipated Kaleskian and Keynesian uh, problematic, but uh, within uh, a profoundly non-Keynesian non -Keynesian setting. If we go back to the introduction to political economy, we also understand that the problem is not, the Luxembourg's problem is not a circulationist problem, it does not come from circulation, but comes from the shocks in capitalist production coming from innovation and uh, the Schumpeter-Grossman competition, let, let me call it, uh, uh, call it this, uh, this way. When there is a change in the rate of surplus value, this very much creates more disproportionalities in a system which is growing up with multiplication of branches and overextend because of credit and banks. The, 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 the change in the rate of surplus value create the likelihood of disproportionalities and then a general, a general uh, glut. Hmm? Uh, 
Let me say that the introduction to political economy, there is uh, another argument which is, I think, very profound and helps to join the dots in the different aspects of Rosa Luxemburg. It is the argument that political economy is bound to disappear after capitalism. Hmm? Uh, Luxembourg thought that the centrality of economic, which is actually colonized, so to speak, by capital, is exactly a peculiarly capitalist feature. The standpoint of labor in class struggle is fighting its own centrality in capitalist totality. The standpoint of labor is not uh, the argument about uh, the, the centrality of forces of production in any kind of mode of production or the centrality of workers in the alternative uh, um, social uh, block and, and so on. Uh, from here, we can understand from this kind of perspective that I gave some aspects of her uh, um, other uh, interventions. She was not a spontaneous, but she came, she went back to a Marxian view of the party. This argument in Italy has been put forward by Lelio Basso, but also by Rossana Rossanda in Class and Party, an article in Socialist uh, Register. That is why Marxian, because here consciousness is not external, but has an origin in social being. But it is not spontaneous because there is always the need to reconnect together the tendency to separation uh, of capital that capital produces in the working, in the working class. Uh, another Italian, Claudio Sabatini, who was uh, the head of the Italian metal workers, did a dissertation at the end of the 60s on Rosa Luxemburg. And she discovered another point of Rosa Luxemburg. When Rosa Luxemburg uh, talked about trade uh, unions against Bernstein, trade unions were just realizing the capitalist determination of the value of labor power for the work working class. They were revolutionary pedagogy. The situation is very different with the mass strike, uh, uh, the, the paper on the mass strike in 1906, where my stri mass strike is the form of manifestation of proletarian struggle in revolution. Uh, this accent against the centrality of production in a capitalist uh, uh, fashion, a capitalist way, is clear also in her few forays on women, we could say together on feminism. There is an article in 1912 on the unproductivity of domestic labor, and she says uh, uh, the musical dancer is productive worker, whereas all the toil of the proletarian women and mothers at home is considered unproductive. And this is true from the point of political economy. This sounds brutally and insane, says Rosa Luxemburg, but corresponds exactly to the brutality and insanity of our present capitalist economy. Let me close with uh, uh, a quote from a letter from Price on uh, December 1906 to Emmanuel and Matilde Worm. It's uh, in a sense also a hard letter to a friend that she criticizes. Uh, for the New Year's greetings, Rosa Luxemburg says, uh, well, you have to find a way to remain a mensch. You know that mensch in German means human being. It is not male. Being a mensch is the main thing. And that means to be firm, lucid and cheerful, despite everything and anything. Whining is the business of the weak. I can't write you a prescription for being a mensch. I only know how one is a mensch. The world is so beautiful even with all its sorrows, and it would be even more beautiful if there were no weaklings or cowards. I think that in this period of uh, COVID uh, and this age full of weakling and cowards, these are enlightening words. Thank you very much, uh, Ricardo. In the real world, there would be a lot of applause uh, Sadly, we have to forego that, um, but you imagine it is there. And without further ado, uh, after this uh, brilliant uh, presentation, uh, we expect another one like that. Uh, the floor is all yours, Radhika. Thank you, Ingo. I hope you can all hear me properly. Um, this is a 
the paper I'm presenting is very much a work in progress and um, it's about, it revolves around the question of capitalist contradiction and imperialism. And it uh, it's also involves me reading Luxembourg through the lens of what I call geopolitical economy, an approach to world affairs that understands the centrality of states in capitalism and thinks about that centrality as being caused by the need to manage the myriad contradictions of capitalism. Okay, so I'm, and I'm going to compress the uh, early con uh, contextual part and then uh, focus more on the actual meat of the argument. So uh, to set the context, I want to begin by a 1992 essay written by a uh, noted Indian Marxist Prabhat Patnayak who asked whatever happened to imperialism. And he noted that imperialism had been the bread and butter of Marxist theorizing in the post-war period up until the 1970s, but that over the previous decade or so, that it had seemed to have fallen off the agenda precisely when imperialism was getting strengthened. Um, I would like to add to that, that this observation, but Nayak's observation is, was true, but it also ignored some more deeper underlying obstacles to Marxist theorization of um, imperialism. And, uh, and particularly in relation to understanding Marxism as, uh, or uh, Marxist analysis of capitalism as contradictory value production. Uh, and this emerges, as I have shown in a number of writings so far, from Marxism's surrender to the bourgeoisie's challenge to Marxism, which took the form of neoclassical economics. As some of you may know very well, Bukharin uh, was, and Hilferding were two people who did try to confront this, as all Marxists should have. But Bukharin then complained that most Marxists seem to be following towards neoclassical Marxism, what he called a policy of theoretical reconciliation. Um, so the result is the bulk of what I today call Marxist economics. I'm not condemning it all. I'm simply saying that there are some underlying structural problems there. Rosa Luxemburg also had to contend with Marxist economics in her famous dissection of the real meaning of Marxist reproduction schemas in the uh, accumulation of capital. However, her efforts, though largely correct, have been generally dismissed. The result has been, the, uh, uh, as I say in one of my recent articles, that by the post-war period, Marxist economists, preeminently those associated with the US Journal Monthly Review, for whom imperialism and anti-imperialism were politically critical, sought to comprehend them through an eclectic theoretical framework leaving the terrain of Marxist analysis of capital as contradictory value production. And later others who we today know as political Marxist as opposed to oppose, uh, uh, such eclecticism as Smithian. And they resorted to a pure and purely economic and therefore largely contradiction-free Ricardian conception of capitalism that stood above the need for state management of its contradictions. And the result of this line of thinking was, as Paul Zaremka rightly noted, that imperialism can and does happen and does aid capital accumulation, but it is not required by the logic of capitalism. So, um, and I think that this kind of thinking about imperialism is deeply wrapped up in the fact that many parts of, many parts of the left and even the Marxist left today uh, are quite confused about the meaning of imperialism. So, um, and, and of course, the latter current, the sort of political Marxist currents tended to deride uh, uh, the other currents who can try, continue to try to prioritize understanding imperialism, although in an eclectic fashion, as suffering from the disease of third worldism. Now, in this context, as if to prove Patnayak right, just when a new form of anti-imperialist resistance appears to have constituted itself around the world in unexpected ways, and uh, many may consider perhaps problematic ways, but nevertheless, it takes the form of the unprecedented industrialization and growth of China, and to a lesser extent, other e emerging economies. Um, and uh, as a consequence, interest in imperialism is growing and there has been quite a wide variety of work. I'm thinking of that of John Smith or Zach Koch, and in particular also of Prabhat and Utsa Patnayak and their um, uh, a theory of imperialism. So this is the context in which I think that it is really useful to go back to Luxembourg to think about trying to uh, reconstruct an understanding of imperialism in Marxist terms rooted in the understanding of capitalism as contradictory value production. So 
to begin with, I want to uh, uh, set Luxembourg in the context of that starburst of Marxist theorizing on imperialism that emerged in the uh, early 19th century. And I begin by noting that Marx, it was not Marxist alone. The social liberal John Hobson had many parallels with Marxist understandings, whereas Schumpeter, of course, stood out because he did not relate imperialism to capitalism at all, but rather attributed it to feudal residues. Um, within the, uh, the remaining uh, uh, theorists, I would class Luxembourg and Hobson as being closely connected because they related imperialism to capitalism per se, rather than a specific stage of capitalism. Um, the latter group, Lenin, Hilferding, Bukharin, um, tended to uh, give rise to the idea, uh, as criticized by Gallagher and Robinson, that uh, gave, gave the impression that somehow before the late 19th century, capitalism had not been imperialist, which was absolutely not true. Um, Hobson and Luxembourg also, of course, rested their understanding on a rejection of Say's law um, and, and therefore on the contradictions of capitalism and not simply some newfound uh, need or imperative to export capital that led to imperialism. Luxembourg is also the only Marxist theorist of imperialism of the time to focus, at least partially, on the effects of imperialism on the colonies. Um, uh, 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 other Marxist theorists, although they were, uh, uh, sorry, the other Marxist theorists were more focused on its dynamics and its effects on relations between the major capitalist powers and the potential for war contained therein. This was not an unjustified focus as leaders of the second international, as leaders of European working classes, they were rightly concerned about the implications of war for the people that they led. Um, okay, um, so far so good. However, in their recent a theory of imperialism, Patnaik and Patnaik fault Luxembourg's account of imperialism uh, on two grounds. Uh, first of all, they say that assuming, uh, uh, they assume that except in stray passages suggesting otherwise, Luxembourg's portrays imperialism as a destruction and assimilation of the pre-capitalist sector by capitalism, which of course reaches a limit when the entire world is under the exclusive domination of capitalism and hence accumulation becomes impossible. And secondly, they point out that because of her emphasis on, on the realization question, even though, uh, uh, even though she discusses accumulation, uh, 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 even though she sometimes talks about the need for raw materials, wage goods, and labor power from the pre-capitalist sector, her focus on imperialism uh, 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 tends to weaken her theory because the fact is that, uh, sorry, her focus on realization tends to weaken her theory because the capitalist state can and has taken on the role of providing demand, making imperialism as she saw it unnecessary, and therefore this weakens her theory of imperialism. Indeed, demand from the non-capitalist world keeps accumulation going. Uh, the, uh, the very fact that such accumulation uh, of such accumulation, however, ent entails expose that this source of demand is not much tapped. Uh, however, the same encroachment, that is to say encroachment on the outside, also ensures supplies of raw materials, wage goods, and labor power itself. And this is by far the most important factor for Patnaik and Patnaik. Luxembourg, even though in discussing accumulation, she talks about capitalism's need for raw materials, wage goods, and labor power from the free capitalist sector, fails to notice that the provision of demand by the state, by contrast, does not simultaneously release raw materials, wage goods, and labor power. Encroaching on free capitalist markets is therefore more favorable to capitalism um, uh, for capitalism than having the state undertake demand management. But her theoretical emphasis on the demand issue pushes this issue into the background. Um, however, and I, I would like to defend Luxembourg on, uh, on the second count, though not quite on the first, because Luxembourg did, despite her support for struggles of colonized peoples elsewhere, take a rather cosmopolitan conception of capitalism, which I criticized in, in, from my perspective of geopolitical economy. And this left little room for national resistance to capitalist imperialism, whether in socialist or capitalist forms. Uh, however, on the second ground, what Patnaik and Patnaik see as Luxembourg's focus on realization was necessitated chiefly by her need to contest the results of Marxist economics 
It tended to portray capitalism as free of contradictions, particularly the contradiction of paucity of demand. The scale of her exertion can be seen in the imbalance of the accumulation of capital, whose sections one and two devoted to this problem take up two thirds of the book. In the rest of it, however, Luxembourg did more, more than just mention the need for raw materials, wage goods and labor and how this is satisfied by the outside of the core capitalist world. She demonstrates a fairly full uh, appreciation of what capital wants and gets from the outside. And this is the aspect of capital imperialism to which Patnaik and Patnaik have so powerfully drawn our attention. Um, Albeit without incorporating these points into an explicit Marxist analysis, Luxembourg points out that the capitalist core does, does not just depend on the outside for markets and investment outlets. Emphasizing this aspect was precisely what made so many, such as the Bill Warren School, feel that imperialism could, would, did develop the third world. However, Luxembourg also notes that it relies on the latter for labor and raw materials, which it cannot itself produce. Explicitly saying that the realization of surplus value is not the only vital aspect of reproduction uh, and that the second requirement of accumulation is access to the material elements necessary for expanding reproduction. Luxembourg refers to how capital ransacks the whole globe for raw materials, noting how much the production of such materials was increased in the 19th century. Luxembourg also emphasizes that the natural supply of labor within capitalism cannot and has never sufficed for reproduction. Hence the vast migrations of labor from outside to the core that have characterized the capitalist world since its beginnings right up to today. Not to mention the marshalling of vast amounts of labor within the outside for the express purpose of supplying the core with cheap raw materials or constant capital or today even manufactured goods of the cheaper sort. In this view, Luxembourg is completely supported by Marx's discussion in chapter 25 of Capital Volume 1, The General Law of Capitalist Accumulation, which is about nothing as much as about population and migration. Both these points are further developed by Patnaik and Patnaik in their brilliant a theory of imperialism. They argue that the existence of the outside is necessary to capitalism to contain the prices of both labor and raw materials and thus maintain the value of money, the sine qua non of capitalism. The way I understand it is this. Pierre Villar long ago argued that capitalism per se is inherently deflationary because it tends to lower the cost of manufactured goods. If so, the chief threat of inflation lies, apart from the mismanagement of money itself, in the prices of labor and the cost of, uh, sorry, the prices of labor and raw materials. By depressing incomes in the outside, which is the chief function of imperialism, according to the Patnaiks, it can be seen to serve as a reservoir of cheap labor to be accessed as and when necessary and to keep prices of food and raw materials that they produce low. This latter is also accomplished not only by keeping the prices of products uh, of the outside low, but also by keeping the incomes of the outside low, something which then lowers their demand for the food and raw materials, et cetera, wage goods, and that therefore also keeps their prices low because if their demand would go up, then the prices of these raw materials would also go up. How critical this is can be seen in the rise of prices of raw materials with the rise of China and other emerging economies. If we accept the Patnaik's argument as an elaboration of Luxembourg's points, we will see that to the, uh, we will see that uh, 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 the to the contradiction identified by Luxembourg that capital in, capitalism incorporates into itself the very outside it needs to exist, we can add another. It is that the imperial core expects contradictory things from the outside. It expects the outside to absorb excess commodities and capital, and it expects it and imposes upon it an income deflation that undermines its capacity to do so. Luxembourg's arguments about unproductive military expenditure and the function of international finance can then be developed and incorporated into this framework, but this is, as I said, still a work in progress. I have only sketched the possibilities, um, uh, theorizing these in clearly Marxist terms, however, still faces obstacles. In my own work on geopolitical economy, I've made a start at removing them and returning uh, to the understanding of imperialism as an imperative that emerges from the contradictions of capitalism as Marx saw them and not as Marxist economists deny them. 
these contradictions are of at least two sorts. One arising from the contradictions of value production itself, from the spheres of accumulation and realization, and others arising from various other spheres, monetary, financial, state, international, and environmental, in which the conditions of capitalist accumulation have to be secured. Nation states have accompanied the development of capitalism because they are implicated in managing its contradictions. As long as they exist, forces resisting capitalism must also fashion similar structures within which to establish and secure for a long transitional period, non and post capitalist societies. In closing, I would like to reflect on a key limitation of Luxembourg's arguments about imperialism. It has precisely to do with her treatment of nation states. Her dismissal of nations and nationalism is regarded as her badge of internationalist honor, and that was, she certainly deserves that, as well as her essentially correct insistence on considering capitalism as a world system, uh, one reflecting the understanding of Marx. However, as I have shown in geopolitical economy, while capitalism is a world system, it is not a cosmopolitan one. Nation states matter in it. Marx and Engels considered nations and nationalism not only as critical supports of imperialism, they also considered nations and nationalisms as the revolutionary anti-imperialist agents of history alongside class, agents that were as fundamental as, uh, to the history of capitalism as classes were. I will end there, thank you. Thank you very much, Radhika. And another round of virtual applause uh, is coming, I'm sure. Uh, and uh, we're now moving from uh, political economy uh, to how it uh, might affect uh, uh, social struggles. And uh, the piece here to look at is obviously uh, Luxembourg's mass strike. And uh, we have two presentations on this topic. The first one uh, next to go is Rita. Please, uh, the floor is all yours. Hi, um, can everyone hear me? At least I can. Um, that's good. So I'm basically going to um, sort of tell a little story about a mass strike, but it won't be in Russia. It will be in Belgium. Um, so here we go. If you ever went to an anti-austerity protest in the United Kingdom in the last decade, you may well have seen the boycott demanding a general strike now. In 2020, in the US, General Strike 2020 briefly trended on Twitter in March, spurred on by popular writers like Naomi Klein and Puig Yusuf Bass. Most tellingly, shortly after this, multiple articles appeared explaining what exactly a general strike is. Of course, no one here would be against a general strike were it to occur. But raising the demand for a general strike through play cards on demonstrations or by rival tweets suggests a decline in our ability to think about what mass strikes are, why they happen, and what can be achieved with them. The basic importance of Rosa Luxemburg in this matter lies in the insight that the, the mass strike as a political means of struggle is simply a historical product of class struggle which just like the revolution can neither be made on command nor rejected on command. Um, this is what she said in the debates in Cologne, um, a piece about the 1905 Trade Union Congress in Germany. This does not mean that we should not think about the mass strikes on the basis that even the most organized workers party cannot simply bring them into being by force of will. But it means we need to think more carefully about what it would mean for the conditions to emerge for a general strike in the course of waging a conscious active class struggle. Both Luxembourg made clear that discussions about a general strike must begin by making some basic distinctions between the industrial mass strike and the political mass strike, and in the latter between the anarchist conception of the political mass strike and the social democratic conception of the political mass strike. As it seems fair to say most calls for a general strike today have typically been concerned with overthrowing government, with acquiring or contesting political power, I want to draw out what exactly the social democratic conception of the political mass strike is and gesture to what that might, might teach us today. And in order to do, to do this, I'm not going to start at 1905, where the mass strikes of the Russian Revolution made the strike as a tactic a spectacular centerpiece of international debate. 
I'm going to start at 1893, where the Belgian workers went on strike for voting rights and won universal, if unequal, male suffrage. What are the conditions of the political mass strike? Henrietta Roland Holst, in her book General Strike and Social Democracy, recommended by none other than Rosa Luxemburg herself, named the main conditions as developed class consciousness and unity between the political and the industrial movement. The essential chronology of the 1893 Belgian strike runs like this. On 12th April, the Belgian parliament rejected a proposal for the introduction of universal suffrage and other election reform proposals. The Belgian Workers' Party called for an immediate strike on 13th April. Some 250,000 workers followed their call. The resulting street demonstrations led to bloody encounters with the police, with 30 workers shot and 100 injured. The Belgian Parliament responded to the demands and agreed to universal male suffrage with people voting, which meant that some men, depending on taxation status and education, could have could have more votes than others. The strike was over. In 1893, the mass strike did not appear as a controversial tactic to the international. The Vienna Arbeiter Zeitung reported approvingly, after two years of a struggle of unparalleled energy and tenacity, our Belgian comrades have won universal suffrage. Today, your victory is marvellous, even if not complete. Warwitz described Belgium as the eve of a social revolution. Luxembourg, when recounting the tale in 1898, said, it confirmed the old truth, he who dares wins, and the best defence is an attack. Revealingly, in 1905, when responding to her trade union critics, the 1893 Belgian general strike was held up alongside the 1905 Russian mass strike as an example the Germans ought to learn from. As the struggle, as the struggle for universal suffrage heated up in Germany in 1910, she repeatedly held it up as the model in her speeches. Return to the first condition of the mass strike, developed class consciousness. How was this built in the Belgian workers' movement? In a speech about the suffrage struggle and its lessons in 1910, Luxembourg narrates this spectacularly. In 1886, a storm tide of strikes broke out. Five years of seeming peace followed, right up until May Day in 1891, um, when the Belgian workers raised their first mass strike for universal suffrage. In any state, even if the most powerful, sort of 125,000 workers, no. Simply put, the general strike of 250,000 could not even have come to the point of occurring without this gross and struggle that preceded it. The patient building of workers' organizations, the capacity to, 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 to strike, to withstand state persecution. But what of the second condition of a political mass strike? Unity between the political and industrial movement. The storm tide of strikes in the late 1880s was aided by energetically by the Belgian Workers' Party. Emile Wanderwelder recounted a quarry worker strike of 2,000 workers in 1889. The provided speakers for, for the strike meeting and 60,000 kilograms of bread, in his words, a beautiful witness of vitality. What distinguished the Belgian general strike of 1893 from the attempts in England by the Chartists to strike for universal suffrage some decades earlier was this. The ind workers' industrial movement trusted the Workers' Party to lead it politically. In the 1893 general strike, an astonishing degree of coordination was demonstrated. The Belgian Workers' Party executive declared a strike on 11th April, as soon as Parliament was looking like they would reject suffrage reform. Within 48 hours, the Belgian trade unions had organized shutdowns across all the major regions. The Belgian Workers' Party was not, of course, a particularly revolutionary party, nor did it have an attitude of unconditional support for strikes. As Marcel Liebman has summarized, the party had fixed a conquest of universal suffrage as the objective of a general strike and rejected all attempts to confer revolutionary content onto a general strike. But precisely this unity between the political and industrial movement allowed the strike to take on a momentum of its own, letting the storm rage for as long as it could. Many have, may have noted that my citations of Emil Wanderwelder are somewhat ironic. He and Rosa Luxemburg would publicly debate the mass strike in 1902, and she would dismiss the Belgian general strike of 1913 in the most cutting terms. 
In 1902, the Belgian workers' movement went on strike once again for universal suffrage, with 300,000 participants. This time, not the slightest concession was achieved. In 1913, another Belgian general strike, this time with 400,000 participants, again without success. Luxembourg identified the reasons for these failures in 1902 and 1913. In 1902, the Belgian Workers' Party had an alliance with the Liberals in Parliament and, as a result, had already committed to maintaining the strike in a restricted and legal form, forbidding demonstrations and agitation in, in advance. As Luxembourg put it, they deflated the latent political power of the general strike into thin air. The 1913 general strike was even worse, planned from 1912 onwards, the party leadership having done everything they possibly could to postpone or prevent it and relenting to organize it in a circumscribed legalistic manner. In Luxembourg's words, it was based on the idea of avoiding any revolutionary situation, avoid any, avoiding any unforeseen turn in the struggle. In this way, even if both the 1893 and 1913 strikes were conducted perfectly peacefully on the side of the workers, the mass strike in Belgium in 1913 represented a backward step in political consciousness, a stultification of the movement. The unity of will and direction had been broken by the Belgian Workers' Party owned leadership. Luxembourg understood that the success of a political mass strike does not depend on mere mathematics, the number of striking workers combined with money with the money in relief funds. It depends on how far you are willing to go and how far your opponents think you could go. Practically speaking, striking terror into the hearts of the bourgeoisie is essential. Many calls for general strikes or even women's strikes in the UK and the US today reflect the dismal Belgian experiment of 1913, but with even less of a mass purpose. They are routinized demonstration strikes in which the spectre of social revolution has been exercised preemptively by the workers' organizations themselves. One day strikes, declared publicly months in advance, give so much time for the state to prepare and head off any potential disruption before any issue occurs. This was the case in the UK public sector pay dispute in 2011. Two million workers went on strike went on strike on 30th November. They dutifully returned to work the next day without having won anything at all. Comfortable in the knowledge that the strike would only last one day, the state made careful preparations for key services to run as normal and simply waited the day out. A political mass strike, when seriously aimed at victory, cannot have limitations forced upon it from the outset. To not know how things may turn out is undoubtedly dangerous. The party and trade union movement may exhaust their resources. They may face rep repercussions by the state that threaten their ability to go on as before. Luxembourg's critics are understandably wary of such consequences of the state's of a political misjudgment. But Luxembourg understood that we do not build organizations for their own sake. We build them as weapons to be deployed at the right moment. That doesn't mean we should throw all hard-won legal rights away in a fit of pique, but it means a readiness to take risks and to push ourselves into confrontation with the state for the conquest of political rights. What Rosa Luxemburg grasped more sharply than many of her contemporaries is that a political mass strike depends upon a dialectic between the organized and the unorganized, which allows a revolutionary consciousness to develop in both. Mass struggle. There will be people who are swept along, caught up in the moment, not conscious of their own actions. These people need not be a liability. Luxembourg's strength was that she neither dismissed them as a wild, unpredictable element of which nothing can be said about in advance, as Karl Kautsky did, nor overestimated an innate radicalism of the unorganized masses, as Anton Panikirk did. She perceived that how the unorganized masses a drawn into political activity is dependent upon the class consciousness that the organized political movement expresses. Confusion, overcourse, and consideration in the organized working class's political leadership and defeatism in the unorganized working class. A realist, predetermined general strike in which a party or trade union leadership imposes artificial constraints before it has even begun is not a revolutionary tactic, it's a raid. Rosa Luxemburg was not a fatalist, relinquishing all of the power of the mass strike to inevitable historical development. Luxemburg, and this is where she drew the most controversy, 
understood that the party was indispensable for the success of the political mass strike. The Social Democrats, as the advanced section of the proletariat, as he wrote in her most famous pamphlet, The Mass Strike, must hasten the development of things and endeavor to accelerate events. This did not mean announcing a mass strike whenever something bad was going to happen, but preparing for one by educating the widest layers of the working class about their strategy and their aims in the impending crisis. Without a party capable of performing the working class forward into the storm, you might as well give up on a political mass strike altogether. In her lifetime, Rosa Luxemburg often faced being stranded as an irresponsible revolutionist, playing hard and fast with what workers depended on for their strengths, their organizations. When contemporary portrayals paint her as a spontaneous, um, I can't pronounce that word, um, someone content to tail social movements as if they arise out of thin air, we do have an even worse disservice. Rosa Luxemburg knew that workers' organizations are, in her words, our tanks, our cannons that we need for struggle. They will undoubtedly get battered in the course of the fight. That's why it's all the more important to build them up strong. The best defense is a good attack and no attack succeeds without organization. That's me. Thank you so much, uh, Rita. That was uh, fabulous. Um, uh, a good start to think about uh, mass strikes uh, in the context of Rosa Luxemburg and today's world. And uh, I guess we will continue that uh, theme with Robert, who is our last um, uh, speaker. Uh, you show us the way, Robert. Floor is all yours. It's hard to follow uh, your presentation, Rita, but I'm going to build upon uh, some of the things that you talked about. So I'm going to depart from uh, what um, others have done, and I'm going to uh, use slides uh, for my uh, presentation. And uh, I'm Robert Ovetz. I'm a lecturer in political science and the author of uh, the two books um, you can see um, about uh, the history of, uh, of strikes in the U.S. Uh, at the turn of the 19th century and a uh, more recent struggle. And I'm an editor with the Journal of Labor and Society. Um, so I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be focusing in on what uh, Rita uh, ended with, um, Rosa Luxemburg's incredible, the mass strike political parties and trade unions in 1906. It's a real honor to be celebrating Rosa Luxemburg's works and her ideas. Um, but I think that this piece in particular is um, an incredible piece of political strategy around the strike. And so I'm gonna pick up some of the things that you talked about, Rita, and in some ways echo it. Um, so I, I'm gonna be uh, sharing um, how I see we can use in Rosa Luxemburg's mass strike and why it's still relevant for understanding the resurgence of class conflict around the world. Um, well, let me start first by talking about what I understand strategy to be, because this is probably one of the most misunderstood uh, concepts among organizers and activists. Um, and I'm going to speak quite quickly. And so I have these slides up. So um, and I'm not going to read all of the passages because of the time limits. So um, I just wanted to share uh, some additional passages as well. Um, so I am going to speak a little bit quickly, and I apologize for that in advance, but I understand strategy to be the path that we take to achieve our objectives. Um, and so what is the method, what is the approach that we use to get to where we're trying to go? Um, I think Marshall Gantz, a uh, social movement scholar, put it really well that the interplay between tactics, strategies, and objectives is turning what you have into what you need to get what you want. And Rosa Luxemburg was very much focused on this in her work, particularly on, in reform revolution and the mass strike, but I'm gonna focus on the mass strike. So it's very clear that Rosa Luxemburg's objective was a revolutionary into capitalism. How did she foresee this would come about? And I, I really like Rita, how you put um, her uh, approach as an analysis 
of, in comparison and critique of the anarchist approach and the social democratic approach. And she was trying to carve out a different way that's increasingly relevant for us as our own union movements and uh, a, a kind of falter. And then also as these kind of performative strikes uh, that you talked about, Rita, uh, have become more prominent. So I'm gonna cover a number of different aspects of, of the strategy uh, that Rosa Luxemburg lays out around the mass strike. And so I'm gonna move kind of quickly through them. And so let me, I'm just gonna preview them on this slide. She focused on the struggle against work, on understanding what I call the class composition. And this is where I, I, I weave in um, uh, autonomous Marxist ideas of the workers inquiry and class composition theory. And I see these elements of class composition and, and working class recomposition in Rosa Luxemburg's piece, as well as her focus on the circulation of the struggle uh, across uh, borders and between different sectors. Um, she also focused on how strikes precede reform rather than reform uh, generating and setting the conditions for strikes, which is very important um, for us today. Also the disciplinary role of unions, and Rita also hit upon some, some of, uh, of that as well, um, particularly with the role of parties in that way. And then also the dead end of contract unionism. She also saw the strike as a political school and as somebody who ran uh, the party school, um, I found it really quite fascinating how she also saw that uh, institutions that workers created themselves functioned also as schools and also um, worker self-organization um, that underlies uh, what she called the mass strike and how these strikes organized by workers themselves uh, made the union rather than the union making the strike. And then finally, uh, her almost uh, paradoxical uh, view of the mass strike as the revolution and the revolution as the mass strike. So let me start with her, her concept of the centrality of the struggle against work. After all, Rosa Luxemburg was a Marxist and she was analyzing capitalism and trying to understand how class struggle could lead to a revolution or overthrow of class struggle. So for her, work was central to these, to these struggles, particularly in reflecting on uh, the strike in St. Petersburg. She wrote that in the month of October, the Grand Duois experiment in St. Petersburg was made the introduction of the eight hour day the General Council of Workers Delegates decided to achieve the eight hour day in a revolutionary manner. That means that on the appointed day, all the workers of St. Petersburg would inform their employers that they're not willing to work more than eight hours a day and should leave their places of work at the end of eight hours. I think the closest analogy to this being from the United States is the IWW, how the Wobblies uh, would call for strikes after a certain number of hours of work. Uh, a, cer a similar strategy was emerging uh, simultaneously uh, around the same time in Russia, the, the attack on the work debt. And she has a couple other passages and uh, for sake of time, I'm not gonna read the other passages. So I'm just gonna read the ones that are in blue. But in several other passages, she also focused on how these strikes were very much targeting uh, 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 work itself, attempting to reduce the work day, even if wages had gone down. She also was very much focused on the classic composition of understanding the current conditions of the organization of workers. Uh, on 161, um, in the edition, the Pathfinder edition that I showed at the beginning of the slides, so these page references are to that, to that volume. Um, she wrote about how the mass strike has now become the center of a lively interest of the German and international working class because it is the new form of struggle and as such is the sure symptom of a thoroughgoing internal revolution in the relations of the classes and in the conditions of the class struggle. So for her, it, the, the class struggle is not an unchanging uh, response to unchanging static circumstances of capitalism, but that different waves of class struggle were in response to the existing conditions that workers found themselves in. So the understanding of those conditions, of those circumstances, how capital changes and reforms itself and introduces new technology and relations of production and management strategies, those are crucial for workers to understand in order to be able to engage with capitalism in the place where they find it. She addresses this on another place on the same page as well. And also of importance, was working class recomposition by understanding the class composition at that time, 
workers are able to devise new tactics and strategies to respond to it and to what I call recompose their power. Um, she, on 176, writes that the apparent chaotic strikes and the disorganized revolutionary action after the January general strike are becoming the starting point of a feverish work of organization. So here, she says, miraculously, what some people would say are disorganized workers suddenly spontaneously striking is actually not spontaneous at all. And, it, and these aren't disorganized workers. These are workers who took the time to understand the current class composition, devise new tactics and strategies, and to be able to organize themselves and actually go on strike. Um, and so he or she's contesting that notion that these are spontaneous strikes, a point that Rita made as well, or that these are called from the top down, as Rita pointed out as well, by the party somehow initiating uh, spontaneous, uh, uh, initiating uh, uh, temporary uh, uh, performative kinds of strikes. And she talks about this in several other places as well. And I wanna share another passage. She writes that since the January general strike and the strikes of 1905, which followed it, the principle of the capitalist master of the house is de facto abolished. In the larger factories of all the important industrial centers and the establishment of workers committees has as if by itself taken place, which uh, with which alone the employer negotiates and which decide all disputes. So these workers' committees were self-organized. I call them invisible committees. They are invisible until they appear. Um, but workers are constantly organizing outside of the view of both the, the, the boss and of the unions and even of the party. And she talks about this in another place as well, a couple other places as well. She's very much focused also on how these strikes circulate and how there's this um, almost energy where a, a strike pops up in one place and suddenly pops up in other places. Um, she doesn't really have a way of explaining how that happens, but we can understand from previous experience, and this is a, a major focus of my first book, is how do these strikes circulate? What are the means by which workers spread the word and share their tactics and strategy? Um, and here she has this amazing passage where she talks about how workers in many different sectors uh, industrial workers to office workers to police are also engaged in, con in, in conflict in the workplace and in going out on strike. She says, this is a gigantic many colored picture of a general arrangement of labor and capital, which reflects all the complexities of social organization and of the political consciousness of every section and of every district. And the whole long scale runs from the regular trade union struggle of a picked and tested troop of the proletariat down from large scale industry to the formless protest of a handful of rural proletarians to the first slight stirrings of an agitated military garrison from the well-educated and elegant revolt in cuffs and white collars in the counting house of a bank to the shy bold murmurings of a clumsy meeting of dissatisfied policemen in a smoke grimed, dark, and dirty guardroom. So police, military, industrial workers, office workers, struggle is circulating throughout the labor force. And she has another passage as well. I think one of the most important things that, that we need to remember and recall from this piece is the importance of understanding the order of things. Um, so often in the United States, we hear that if we only change the labor law, uh, workers will be able to better organize unions um, and better be able to strike. Um, but Rosa Luxemburg, in, in some ways, I see as the first person to point out that it's not that labor law makes it possible for workers to organize unions and strike, but it's the strike itself that changes the labor law to institutionalize and in, in, in fact, instrumentalize and control the strike. Um, and she makes this point that the, pedant, the pedantic conception, which would unfold great popular movements according to plan and recipe, regards the acquisition of the right of, of combination for railroad, railway workers as necessary before anyone would dare to think of a mass strike in Germany. The actual natural course of events can only be the opposite of this. Only from a spontaneous, powerful mass strike action can the right of combination for the German railway workers as well as for postal workers actually be born. So she says it's the complete opposite. It's, it's that the strike leads to labor law reform. And she talks about this as, as Rita talked about as a, uh, you know, as attempt for constitutional reform. She also identifies unions as a disciplinary tool that, it, that attempts to control and manage and even prevent strikes. And uh, I say I'm running short on time. 
Um, but in this passage, she talks about how uh, trade unions discipline their members and restrain from street rioting, um, or argue that care should be taken that the masses do not stream out into the streets, or that others should hold back from wages movements when other workers are on strike. In other words, that unions attempt to suppress solidarity and sympathy strikes. She also talks about how uh, the focus on the union and the contract itself is also a tool for disciplining and suppressing the strike. She talks about how there's first of all an overvaluation of the organization from which a means has gradually been changed into an end in itself, a precious thing to which the interests of the struggle should be subordinated. So the institution, the contract itself become the most important thing, not the workers organization. And again, she talks about how it places the highest value in the smallest economic achievement. And then she sees the strike as the political school, as I talked about before, um, in which um, by organizing themselves and striking, uh, the workers learn through a living political school in the moment. It's not something that can be taught. It's something that workers learn and teach themselves in the process of organizing themselves. And a couple other places where she talks about that. And she focuses very much on how workers self-organize. Um, there's almost a wholly unorganized, uh, who are the workers of Russia who are almost wholly unorganized created a comprehensive network of organizational appendages in a period of a year and a half of this revolutionary period. So it's not coming from the unions, it's not coming from the parties, it's the workers not only organizing themselves in their individual workplaces, but actually connecting with other workers doing the same throughout the labor force. And then she talks about, importantly, how the strike makes the union. I think this is one of the most important things that we uh, need to refocus our efforts on. Um, and she talked about how it swept away an existing union um, because the workers appreciated and understood the importance of organization, that only they can create these organizations. Um, and I'm, I'm out of time, but I just wanted to make a last note in a few seconds that she also concludes by drawing this almost paradoxical uh, 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 identification of uh, the mass strike being the revolution and the revolution being the mass strike. It's this paradox that you can spend a lot of time really trying to un, un, unwrap and try to understand what she meant by that. Um, and um, so this is uh, an exciting time to be uh, thinking about Rosa Luxemburg's strategy and why it's relevant for us today. I think my mic is on now again. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Robert. Thank you very much, uh, all other three speakers. Uh, that's a lot of stuff to think about. Um, and we still have some um, time for discussion and uh, still hoping there's an audience in this virtual world which can follow us. Um, uh, so please uh, feel free to come up with questions and uh, while you think about some, there actually already was one, it wasn't directed at anybody in particular. Um, but uh, whoever I have some suspicions who might be interested uh, answering that, more than one, I guess. Uh, um, I think you can actually see that, uh, Lauren passed that on. Um, there was the question whether maybe uh, Hart Negri's work on empire would be more fitting for today's world. Um, than uh, Marx and uh, I think ML does not mean Marx and Lenin, though Lenin might also have something to say, but Marx and Luxembourg, anybody wants to take a shot at that, uh, just go for it. Um, I'll just say the short answer is no. Um, I think that uh, in general, um, uh, uh, the way I looked at Hart and Negri's book, which I haven't looked at in a long time, not since it first came out, is that it was essentially giving the label of empire to the phenomenon, the alleged phenomenon of globalization, all of which are extremely superficial theorizations. And I think if we want to really understand capitalist imperialism rather than some grand transhistorical notion of imperialism, which would be meaningless anyway, we have to root it in the operations of capitalism and the contradictory a functioning of capitalism. And um, so, yeah, that will be my short answer.
Anybody else on that question? May I say something? Certainly. Okay. Uh, I think that the short answer is no, but uh, uh, I would add some other arguments uh, to those of Radhika. The, the first thing is that, yes, I, I read the book a long time ago. Uh, when, it when it came out, by chance I was in a left-wing Washington bookshop in the morning, DuPont Circle, uh, 1999, I think. Uh, I saw this book, I, I knew nothing about that. And the, the, the young person who was there selling the book explained to me who was Negri was, et cetera, and told me that they had the book one week before. He, this guy didn't know that I was Italian. Uh, now, the point is that I, uh, my memory, of course, I may be wrong, is that in Empire, the book, I'm not talking about what he said later on, there is the idea that there is a kind of Kauskian ultra-imperialism. Uh, there, there are no... Mm, this, this empire works with police actions. There is no uh, tendency to war and the crisis has been overcome. Now, I have not, never seen uh, some theoretical uh, or political statement this confirmed so quickly in three, four, three, four years. Hmm? Uh, there were the wars, crisis came, came back in and so on. Uh, I think that the categories are very, very different, multitude, class, et cetera. Now, the, the, the real problem is the other one. Can we just look at contemporary capitalism through the lenses of Marx and Luxembourg? Well, I am not sure. I think that we cannot think of contemporary capitalism we, without starting from those notions. But there has been fundamental changes. Capitalism is always capitalism. But I, I, I just give you two examples. One is uh, concentration and centralization of capital. And the second one is uh, uh, the socialization of workers in, in, in the factories. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea of Marx that capital create an Im immediate socialization of workers. That is uh, to exploit workers, capital must put them together in the labor process in a sense centralization is linked to that. Now, in contemporary capitalism, there has been a crisis since 30, 40 years. There has been a, a problematization of these two, two features. Uh, there is an ongoing centralization of capital, but, sorry, yes, centralization of capital, but concentration is not the same thing as before. In a sense, we don't have a, a tendency to a bigger and bigger factories of the same kind. I'm referring exactly to the categories of Marx in Capital, Volume 1, as he defined them. So we have witnessed, not in all the world, China may be a difference, I don't know, but in most of the capitalist world, we have seen a, a centralization mm, without concentration. The socialization of workers, yes, socialization of workers is going on, but in a way in which capital is able to put together workers without really putting them together through technology. They, they may they think of Uber, think of Deliveroo. They may be connected to through an algorithm. So these are real problems, I think, that Marx and Luxembourg gives the, the, the starting point to answer these questions, but there is, there is something which goes beyond the Negri and on one side, Marx and Luxembourg on the other. Um, let me just add very briefly to Ricardo's very, I think, important um, uh, points. Um, I think one can also see it. I mean, what, the reason why the notion of contradictions is so important is precisely because you see capitalism sort of 
essentially losing its nerve. I mean, basically, you're looking at a system in which capital is basically saying that except for certain relatively high value activities, it is unable to produce in the homelands of capitalism. It has to extend production out of them. And that is, uh, you know, and, and I think that that's, that's really, I mean, rather than necessarily a sort of, you know, refutation of Marx, I see it as a, you know, essentially the unfolding of contradictions that he well identified in a context, particularly, by the way, in a context where I would say that the life of capitalism has been lengthened by the weakness of the left. This is an important point we have to make. So uh, in a certain sense, the morbid symptoms are multiplying, but no, but there is not a force that is capable of saying, okay, capitalism is finished. We need a more sensible rational system. We have to take power, et cetera. And it's not there and partly, and I'm very glad to hear uh, uh, readers and Robert's uh, papers as well, because one of the things that, and I, I'm, I'm gonna stop in a minute because there's a mass strike question that I also wanna listen to the discussion of, but the point is that it's because so much of the left is simply involved in what I call Proudhonist economics and network politics. And unless we put back in the center of the discussion, the two P's, parties and planning, we're not gonna get very far. So I will end there. Thanks very much. Um... Actually, Ricardo's uh, answer to the Hartnagy question, uh, kind of talking about the disorganizing of working classes or organizing workers only so that they can uh, do their work but not uh, um, start uh, forming a class. Um, there's a question which is, uh, I guess, for Rita and Robert uh, about the mass strike, which role the concentration of workers in factories and uh, working class neighborhoods around them played in the mass strikes uh, that uh, Luxembourg wrote about and how that uh, might apply or may not apply in today's world where those uh, factory quarters, factories and factory quarters uh, don't exist, at least don't exist in the first world that uh, uh, most people um, think of when they think about uh, working class. So do you have any thoughts on that question? Whoever wants to go first, I see Rita's hand up. So why don't you take the floor? I think often there was a sort of overestimation of the sort of degree of industrialization and centralization in a lot of European countries in the late 19th and early 20th century. I do not have numbers to hand, so I'm not going to kind of embarrass myself by um, making like big generalizations. But if you actually look at like the backgrounds of like a lot of German Democrats, German social Democrats of this period, they weren't factory workers. They were sort of craftsmen, they were apprentices, they were they were working under sort of small, small craft shops rather than massive factories, and yet they still like built up a class consciousness. But the one figure I do have is that even sort of you know, seven in Germany, where you have a sort of industrialization after German unification, 40% of the population employed in the second the economy. That is a huge number of people who aren't actually employed in factories. So I basically think that you still have centers of sort of um, working class social life and working class organization. Now, if you look at, for example, in the UK, you have council estates, you have social housing blocks, you still have, I, I, I don't want to um, sort of ramble on, but like, for example, I think things like tenants unions and sort of organizing based on sort of common housing is quite a useful way of building up a sort of consciousness of class identity. But I think the thing is, I think we often think, oh, it was like objectively easier for people to like organize in Imperial Germany or Belgium than it is to organize today, but it actually wasn't. Um, you know, they faced a lot of state persecution. You were like barred from a lot of social life if you are a social Democrat in Germany up until like quite late on. Um, they actually, it was a hugely difficult and unrewarding task to build up trade unions in this period, but people did it. Um, and there was actually, there's basically, my sort of short answer is I think it was just as hard to build up consciousness in sort of imperial Germany or 19th century Belgium as it is today, but there are just no shortcuts. You still have to go ahead and do it if you think it's worth doing. Robert, do you want to add to that? 
Absolutely. This is this is one of the big problems that we're dealing with today is this idea that the factory has somehow disappeared. Even in the United States, um, the recent data shows that um, even though the number of factory workers has gone down in the last few decades, the amount of industrial labor that's still happening is still there. But the focus shouldn't just be on industrial work in a traditional sense. It should be understood as all work. Um, even um, Amazon is a good example of how workers are adapting uh, in the way that Rosa Luxemburg taught us. They're adapting to the changing circumstances. It might appear uh, overwhelming and impossible to organize in Amazon, but as some of you may know, right now there's actually uh, a, a network of Amazon workers in numerous countries that are engaging in forming their own self-organized unions on the workplace. Some are not seeking recognition as formal unions. They're using the, the, the model that Rosa Luxemburg identified and that the Wobblies also used. Some like in Alabama right now are seeking formal recognition. But what's really extraordinary about this is uh, we actually held a couple of panels on Amazon of, uh, as part of a Pluto Press uh, series of authors. And um, what we found from the folks, the, the Amazon workers who joined us was that they're all in communication. They all know each other in Germany, in Poland, in the US, in other countries, in different cities around the US. So where it seems like Amazon, the world's most powerful corporation right now that's using advanced algorithmic management tools and mass data valence and surveillance, um, that workers are gonna have a hard time overcoming that because it's so decentralized and the corporation has so much power. But the reality is that there have been numerous strikes and struggles of workers in Amazon and they circulate um, and they even meet regularly. Um, and it's something that um, we're gonna be hearing a lot more about. And essentially in order to, to do that, these Amazon workers have engaged in, they might not call it this, but they've engaged in a worker's inquiry. In the same way that Rosa Luxemburg talked about the need to understand the conditions. These Amazon workers have studied the structure and organization of Amazon to respond to it and develop new tactics and strategies. And it's quite extraordinary. And you can read some of the first person accounts in, in a magazine called Labor Notes, and you can find that online. And essentially what they've demonstrated is that factories are no longer limited, if they ever were, and you know, our, our, the earlier discussions about imperialism demonstrate this is not a new phenomenon, but an individual factory is not an isolated island. They're part of a global social factory, part of a global network of, uh, of places of production and reproduction. Um, and so we have to understand the entire supply chain and um, how capital organizes across that supply chain to find its weaknesses. And that's what is starting to emerge is what are called choke points. Um, and Amazon apparently has a number of choke points. Um, and, um, and so there's a lot to be learned from Luxembourg that's still relevant for us to, under the current conditions. We are almost out of time, but uh, if uh, our mass strike experts uh, could uh, quickly uh, say something to Autocar's question, whether um, there, where there might be a, a basis for mass strikes, uh, except at uh, Amazon, Volkswagen, and Mercedes, uh, who uh, Autocar thinks uh, are places where such strikes might emerge. So where else? If there's uh, quick ideas, shoot. Well, I, you know, very briefly, I, I don't think, um, I don't think strikes are spontaneous. Um, and, you know, a couple of years ago, you, you've probably heard in other countries about um, the spread of wildcat strikes of teachers uh, in the US. It was quite extraordinary. In uh, about 10 states in the colony of Puerto Rico, uh, teachers went on strike and it appeared, and they were almost all in anti-union states where they had a very, very hard rules on uh, unions. And uh, they appeared to be spontaneous, but the reality is that these teachers had been in communication with each other. They had been working in the neighborhoods and the communities with parents and families, uh, with other workers at the schools, um, and um, that they were able to shut down entire public education systems across the state. We have a very decentralized education system in the US. It was pretty extraordinary. And I think that that is you know, what we call um, you know, the, 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 the um, the, the red for ed movement um, was a demonstration where that's possible. 
Okay, thank you very much. Um, Ricardo, very briefly, because then I guess I will have yes, to- Yes, on this point, I, I just want to, to say that uh, it is interesting to see that three years ago, I think, if not four, there was a wonderful article on the Financial Times, a notorious Leninist Luxembourgian uh, newspaper by Sarah O'Connor, uh, when your boss is uh, an algorithm. She was tracing the uh, reorganization of labor as an ultra tailorist uh, organization in uh, Uber and Deliveroo. There was that kind of uh, disorganization that I stress. This I use very much at the end of my talk. Uh, and even though it seems an impossible situation, it is exactly as, as Rita said, we are in a situation like uh, maybe two centuries ago, uh, the beginning of the work, uh, working movement, when there was precarization, but organization was created. I don't go into the details, but there were, there were struggles from Uber workers and Deliveroo. As we all know, there are a similar one in, in Italy. They went to, the, to trial and something has been constructed. Are they spontaneous? No, I don't think they are spontaneous, but they are within the working, the Eden abode, the working class, it's a, it's a long uh, uh, journey and you don't know if you win. <laughs> if, if I may add, I think that we also have to understand that uh, it, even in, historically, I'm sure you can demonstrate that working class struggles weren't just about the workplace or focused on the workplace. They were always about securing the conditions of a decent life. And those questions persist among all those people, whether they are employed or unemployed, whether they are part-time employed or gig workers or whatever. And I think that it is not, in, especially in the time of COVID, when so many things are going wrong, so many things are breaking down, it's actually possible to open up a lot of struggles around not just production, but reproduction issues, as Rosa Luxemburg might say. And I think that this, is, this, this could be key. And I think in that sense, I, simply securing an economy that works, and it would have to begin at the, at the national level. I think reinserting uh, the question of national economies, national states, at least as transitional forms before we, because quite frankly, I think nation states are a problem of capitalism and they're not going to go away. We go, and we're gonna need something like that until we get to the point where a majority or the most powerful countries in the world are no longer uh, a, a capitalist, then you can talk about ending the nation state, et cetera, et cetera. But in the meantime, one needs something like that. So, yeah. Okay, my last call to the speakers, if they do have some uh, short final conclusions they wanna make before we end, so uh, people have something to take away from this. Um, so whoever wants to go, please shoot. Well, I, I'd like to respond perhaps just a little bit to Deborah's point because the other point that I kind of feel which connects up with the conditions of in which working people live today, which is a, one thing you definitely see is that, well, at least in parts of the working class, perhaps the more privileged parts of the working class, what you have missing is a sense of community. Why is it that the discourse of entrepreneurship or informal jobs as Deborah has posed here uh, so easily penetrates the working class. It's because the working class does not have the community, which then produces its own discourses that are capable of feeling the working class against such insidious discourses. So we are all more individualized. And, and, so there is, and where the communities exist, they exist in a sort of, among the relatively pauperized sections of the working class who live in sort of dense inner cities and, and so on, where their community is vitiated by things like over-policing, deprivation, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that recreating some forms of working class community would be very, is very important to any kind of working class movement. Others having final comments? Rita. I want to like quickly um, speak to a question in the chat about um, whether the mass strike kind of leads to council communism. I, 
I sort of think in terms of Luxembourg's view, it doesn't, because up until the end of her life, Rosa Luxembourg was incredibly committed to the idea of a working class socialist party. Um, and Anton Panakirk, who was kind of one of the progenitors of the council communism idea, was kind of led to reject the party altogether. Um, Rosa Luxemburg's sort of conception of the mass strike, which she lays out in her pamphlet, very much is sort of contingent on the political party playing the sort of educative pedagogical role of raising the consciousness of the working class as they take action. I don't think he like I don't think he kind of has an idea of a sort of mass strike that takes place without a party or without a party leadership. Um, like her, the mass strike pamphlet is a sort of a criticism of the SPD for um, for not not fulfilling their historical tasks in terms of preparing the working class to perform a mass strike. Um, so yeah. Thank you, Robert and Ricardo. Any final? Comments? Yeah, I, I want to address Deborah's point as well because this is becoming increasingly common characteristic of the working class around the world that the conditions that were found in the global south have now come to the global north. And for the last few decades, precarious labor has grown as a proportion of, uh, of the labor force. And being a precarious academic myself, I know how difficult it can be uh, for uh, temporary part-time workers who are heavily monitored um, by data valence uh, to organize. Um, but I think that we're starting to see, as Ricardo mentioned before with the with the article that you were talking about, about Uber workers and delivery Roo workers who are learning how to use that technology that is intended to manage them, to organize. Um, and so we're, we're seeing a lot of, a lot of examples where uh, in some ways um, uh, workers are learning the lesson that Rosa Luxemburg identified during the 1905 strike and identifying and understanding the conditions in which they find themselves to find new tactics and strategies. Uh the only, may I? Yes, Ricardo, you were the first and you have the final word. No, the only thing that I could do now is uh, uh, to go back to what I said about uh, social reform and, uh, and the revolution. I, I said that there are resolution is, is very uh, intriguing because she uh, counters Bernstein uh, who said, but well, uh, there, is, there is not only the concentration into big firms uh, and the workers uh, are becoming embedded in capitalism and so uh, the, there are less contradictions and so on. And she, dis she distinguished, as I said, a tendency from a counter tendency. And he said, no, there are more and more contradictions but the analysis of Marx is not too flat. There is a tendency to concentration of capital and unification of the working class, uh, even though there is a periodical counter tendency uh, according to which there is the recreation of small and medium firms, uh, uh, there is the fragmentation of workers, etc. Now, the, the, the paradoxical state of the last decades, uh, in my view, is that relative to, 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 to Rosa Luxemburg's argument, the tendency has become the counter tendency mm, in both cases. So we, we, we seem to live in a situation in which the tendency is the fragmentation of workers uh, and the same thing about, about capital. But as we have seen, it all depends from a non-mechanical in interaction with the, with the working class. And what is for sure is that this new capital is not reducing the contradictions, but increasing the contradictions. So we are really in, in, in a situation in which we cannot take for granted uh, the, the heritage of, uh, of, the, of, of the working movements, but we have a, a, a lot to learn from them, and we have to build again uh, struggles, uh, theory, and so on uh, from a rich legacy that we have from Marx and from Luxembourg. Okay, I want to thank 
everybody for their great contributions. Uh, I think that was a great start. And uh, I uh, have a sense that in a way, uh, kind of there's something to take away from this panel, which is, uh, if I may um, put it uh, like that, uh, capitalism offers us a lot of chances uh, to struggle against it because it produces so much uh, discontent, but uh, it is also very good at disorganizing all uh, left communities, whether it's working class uh, neighborhoods, uh, tenant uh, organizations, uh, peasant communities, or many others. Um, and uh, like uh, Radhika said, um, there's a lack of uh, opposing communities. I think there's a lack of uh, language uh, to build these communities. This is uh, why some people, why it might seem that Hart and Negri are right, that it's kind of all free floating small little groups who have nothing to do with each other. But uh, taking the point uh, Rita and uh, Robert uh, were making in their presentations, what seems to be an automatic spontaneous uprising of workers in the past seems so only with hindsight. It can seem like that, but it never was. Um, working classes um, looked very differently in terms of their objective composition back in the day. Uh, and there was nothing automatic about them coming together. Uh, it had to be built by kind of finding uh, common languages, uh, articulating uh, common ideas, uh, identifying uh, who to struggle against and how to do so. And uh, we achieved a lot of the, along the way in the 20th century, despite all the setbacks, uh, but capital then fought back on a big time and disorganized us on the left uh, to the point of, uh, if I may say, uh, being nothing but a multitude. And now we're trying to scramble back together uh, and my sense is uh, Rosa Luxemburg, both in terms of understanding the economic conditions under which we struggle, but also in terms of identifying ways uh, to come together anew, uh, has a lot to offer. So thank you very much for contributing to that. And with that, uh, I say uh, goodbye to everybody. <laughs>